Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we're going to give folks just a minute or so to uh, come into the Zoom room. Uh, we're looking very forward to our conversation tonight. So as you all join, if you would like to tell us where you're joining from, we would love to hear that. You can pop that right in the chat. Um, so please give us, uh, give us a little information about where you're joining from this evening. Uh, we would love to know. Hello everyone, as Director of North Carolina Center for the Book here at North Carolina Humanities, it is my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. I am Melissa Giblin and I am so excited to welcome you to this evening's virtual book event. With many other choices to spend your time, I thank you for choosing this event and for joining us at the fourth book event in a series for North Carolina Reads, our statewide book club for 2023. North Carolina Reads features five books that explore issues of racial, social, and gender equality, and the history and culture of North Carolina. As a nonpartisan statewide nonprofit, and as North Carolina's affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, our mission is to connect North Carolinians with cultural experiences that spur dialogue, deepen human connections, and inspire community. This evening features a moderated panel discussion on Under a Gilded Moon, the fourth book in our 2023 North Carolina Read series. Please note any views, findings, conclusions, opinions, or recommendations expressed by our partners and participants do not necessarily represent those of NC Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities. It is my pleasure to welcome North Carolina Humanities Board Trustee, Mike Wakeford, as this evening's moderator. Dr. Mike Wakeford is a historian and faculty member at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, where he teaches courses in history and the humanities in the undergraduate division of liberal, liberal arts. He has interests in the history of the arts in American life, cities, and public history. He is also the executive director of Muse Winston-Salem, a community history museum dedicated to telling an inclusive story of Winston-Salem and leveraging meaningful dialogue around the city's past, present, and future. We would also like to welcome Joy Jordan Lake and Dr. Jennifer Lazat as our panelists. Before we begin, we will briefly discuss a few housekeeping points for this evening's event and practice how to engage with us. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available after the live session, as are the previous three NC Reads events, if you would like to visit our YouTube channel at North Carolina Humanities. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel to get notifications when our videos um, are available, and we hope you give the videos a like. We'd love to hear from you during today's event. If you have a question for our author or panelists, please send it either through the chat or the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your screen. Closed caption is available by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to share your experiences on social media by tagging at NC Humanities on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Under a Gilded Moon is a historical fiction set amongst the backdrop of the Gilded Age during the final construction of the Biltmore Estate. Carrie McGregor's future is derailed when, after two years in college in New York City, family obligations call her home to the beautiful Appalachians. As Carrie finds herself caught in a war between wealth and poverty, innocence and corruption, she must navigate not only her own pride and desperation to survive, but also the temptations of fortune and the men who control it. It is my pleasure to turn the event over to Mike to formally introduce our panelists. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I am honored to be here and appreciate um, the opportunity to, uh, to moderate this event, um, but I will, uh, I will moderate light and get out of the way um, just as, as soon as I can. I'm going to start um, by uh, doing some proper introductions of our esteemed guests and, um, and then have a, have a few questions to, um, to ask. So um, first, introductions. Uh, Joy Jordan Lake is best -selling, a best-selling award-winning author of 11 books, including the recently released A Bend of Light, A Tangled Mercy, and Under a Gilded Moon. 
Having earned two master's degrees as well as a PhD in English literature, her academic work has focused on race, gender, and theology, particularly in regard to 19th century novels by women. She's also published two children's picture books. Having lived all over the eastern half of the United States, Joy currently resides outside Nashville, Tennessee, but spent many of the summers of her youth and young adult years in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And then uh, Dr. Jennifer Lazat is Associate Professor of History and the Director of the Graduate Public History Program at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Her research focuses on material culture and capitalism as it intersects with race, gender, and sexuality in the 19th and 20th century United States. She's the author of From Goodwill to Grunge, A History of Secondhand Styles and Alternative Economies. Her work has appeared in both academic and popular venues, including CNN Opinion, Slate.com, and Smithsonian. Her current book project is on the history of dressing for success in America at the turn of the 20th century. So welcome to you both. Thank you for, uh, thank you for being here. Um, so I will start um, with, uh, with a, one question for each of you. Um, I, since I can't ask them both simultaneously, I'll ask a question to Joy first. Um, Joy, can you tell us a little bit more about what led you to look at uh, this era of history and uh, to craft a story about it? I love, in fact, I could probably sit with you and Jennifer for hours late into the night and talk about this era, but um, it's, you know, it's a fascinating era where um, you have lots, um, lots of political ideas clashing, you have um, lots of new people groups coming to the United States, you have um, just massive change going on, as you all well know. Um, and I, I, as I was enthralled with the Biltmore and thinking about maybe making that the center of my next novel, there were two different time periods that I was toying with. One was that when the, Gil the Biltmore first opened, 1895-96, and then also um, World War II. There's a whole story of the Biltmore's role during World War II. So, but anyway, I landed on, landed on this and, um, and it was great fun to get to do the research. Right. Jennifer, uh, can you begin by um, speaking to the larger historical context um, of the Gilded Age in the United States um, that obviously composes the backdrop uh, for this novel? Sure. Uh, like Joyce said, you know, we could be here all night, but uh, I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> this is a fascinating time of uh, enormous change, uh, technological, this is the second industrial revolution. This is a period when the United States is really building its international reputation as far as goods and commerce. Um, it's an uh, era of great commercialization in the United States. And as this book portrays, it's an era of great disparity in wealth, right? There's there's a lot of tension, political and material, between labor and employers, and um, and a lot of that intersects with the tensions between those incoming people groups that Joy referenced. So there's there's just a lot going on. There's a lot of opportunity, and there's a lot of tension, and there's a lot of change. Right. Thank you. So um, what kind of impression does Biltmore uh, make on different visitors to the estate? I'm sure each of us has our own answer to that, that question, but uh, to take that as a, at a, at a general level, uh, maybe, maybe one or both of you uh, could, could weigh in on the, on the matter of the, the impression that Biltmore uh, leaves with people. It's a, you know, anyone who's been there, of course, it's just the setting is just amazing. Um, I have a story I can tell later about my own draw to the, to the Biltmore, but it's, um, to me, it's, you know, the, the, its place in the mountains is just splendid. Um, George Vanderbilt did a beautiful job, you know, kind of picking the spot that if I had all the money in the world, I probably would have picked that very spot um, for that sort of house. Um, just, just amazing. But it is, 
you're right to sort of say different people having different impressions. I, in a number of times as I was doing research for this, showing up at the Biltmore and sort of watching the people going through, it was really interesting to see the different sorts of people who are going through and some who clearly had the sort of, gosh, I wish I got to live here sort of look and, you know, all the selfies. And um, and I think a lot of us could just totally live in the library at Biltmore, you know, if, if I could just have that one room. Um, but, you know, I was where my my youngest child um, was born in China. She's um, she's adopted. And, um, I, you know, it's striking being with her there and kind of being aware of Oh, you know, I wonder what it feels like to be of Asian descent walking through. And so that was part of my goal was to find, you know, was there an one Asian character I could have in this story, sort of thinking of her and went digging in the Asheville um, Public Library archives and found a legitimate historical character um, that one of my or a person that one of my characters is based on. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question because, of course, I think to some it feels like goodness, what a wonderful sort of cathedral to beauty and art and books and the outdoors. And, and to others, it feels like, as Jennifer sort of referenced, sort of this, um, dis the disparity of wealth that's sort of writ large, you know, this sort of, wow, someone could build this sort of house while other people couldn't feed their children. And so yeah. it's, it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you're, you're, touching on I'll, I'll just kind of add to the the question and Jennifer if you want to if you want to um uh, contribute on on this the, the those different reactions do seem to have a lot to do with the with the the broader theme of of wealth and equality and and, and maybe the sort of piggyback on on your previous answer in terms of the context what are what are the conversations around wealth equality wealth inequality that are going on in the in the uh, in the gilded age um, well, I'll kind of relate that to the one thing that I, I think is so broadly valuable about historic sites um, and kind of a direction that historic preservation is going in and an interpretation of sites like that is rather than just reflecting the imagination and wealth of great men like George Vanderbilt, you can also tell the stories of some of the workers who helped build it, the um, transportation involved in creating this, the technological, historical context, um, where all of the things are coming from, the influences, uh, and I apologize if my internet's a little doing something funny. You're, but... you're okay. It glitched okay. for a moment, but you're okay. <laughs> So it, in the Gilded Age, because you had all of these opportunities for labor in this country, a lot of workers would go wherever they could to do this. So it's exactly true, as Joy depicts in the novel, that you would find far-flung peoples in a location like the middle of the mountains, as long as there was labor provided, promised, and, and guaranteed, because uh, globally, there was so much conflict and strife that the, you know, historians talk about the push factors and the pull factors of immigration and the wealth that the Vanderbilts embodied is a very big pull factor while political and, you know, religious uh, strife in other places is a major pull factor. And it's really interesting to see that set in the middle of a relatively or very rural uh, outpost of North Carolina. But that was something fascinating about the late 19th century is we're on the edge of becoming an urban nation, but we're still really a rural nation. More than 50% of the population still lives outside of cities. So this is where stuff's happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, Joy Joy mentioned um, the char the character of or gestured toward the character of, of Ling Yang a, a, a moment ago and, and a fascinating um, personal sort of connection to to your introduction of um, of an Asian character. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, about immigration um, and and the the, immig the immigration story um, is looms large in in this in this uh, book, obviously. Um, so using the experiences of Sal, Nico, 
and Ling Yang as as some of the examples. What what was going on in the, in this period around immigration? What were the various kind of social and cultural reactions to immigration and the the figure of the immigrant in the Gilded Age America? Well, you've got um, I can speak. Um sort of to the characters. And then of course, Jennifer probably has the wonderful statistics behind it that I've probably long since forgotten. But um, the my, my husband is actually from Sicily or his family from Sicily and Calabria. So it was fascinating to be reminded as I did the research for this novel, you know, you kind of dive in head first and go, what are the big issues people are arguing about or writing about or, you know, um, and one was, you know, these awful Italians coming to America and um, just this, the level of fear of the Italians, especially the Southern Italians, even the Northern Italians didn't like the Southern Italians, which was something I had forgotten, frankly. Um, you know, it was precisely my husband's sort of family, the Sicilians and the Calabrians that, um, you know, this fear of the mafia, the fear that... Um, you know, that they, they had dark hair and, um, and they were, you know, just the other. Um, so that was fascinating to me. And here at the Biltmore, you had, had all these folks who built the, the actual structure of the Biltmore itself, who were brought here from Southern Italy. Um, mm -hmm. So that was fascinating to me. And just, but the, but reading the old documents and newspapers and, um, political speeches. And it's, you know, it's really chilling uh, what was what was said. And then, um, of course, the Chinese Exclusion Act is right around here, 1892. Um, and again, chilling to go back and read um, what was being said about the need to keep Chinese people out of the country. So, um, you know, good, good for any of us, right, to go back and have to read the actual words um, and be reminded of what the fights were just really not that long ago. So you mm -hmm. don't, I think most people, you don't look at the Biltmore and think, ah, immigration. <laughs> you're just, right. you're thinking about great art and great books and great setting and, you know, the outdoors and fabulous architecture and a really interesting guy, George Vanderbilt. Um, but yeah, it really, in many ways, embodies a lot of these struggles that were going on in our country. Sure. Jennifer, you want to, you want to add to that? Sure. Well, I, the, we've always in the United States since its formation had immigration, but the kind of immigrants who are coming to this country changed in about the 1880s. And, you know, historians call this new immigrants, right? And so we start to have a lot more um, uh, laborers come into this country, a lot more people who might not speak English very well, right? And as Joy kind of referenced, people who were othered, who weren't quite considered white, right? For one reason or another from Southern or Eastern Europe and who were associated with socialist ideology and radical notions, Marxism, communism even, right? who had, you know, partook in uh, labor unions already and were maybe carrying those ideas to this country where at this time it's not at all settled whether or not capitalism or laborers will win in the battle between who has kind of primacy in determining control in production and consumption. Um, so these are all a lot of the issues that are causing the Madison Grant type ideals, right, to say, you know, this is ruining the country in a variety of ways. There's also a lot of fear about quote unquote, race suicide, how, you know, if we're being overwhelmed by immigrant populations, the, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Americans aren't reproducing at the same levels. So all of this social change is sort of um, combining to create um, a pretty unpleasant uh, atmosphere for certain groups of immigrants. And as Joy alluded, the Chinese Immigration uh, Exclusion Act is the first time the United States actually specifically uh, excludes or creates quotas for uh, people from any a, a specific nation state. So yeah. it's kind of the, the start of uh, formally politically othering groups of people across the globe. Yeah, and and I would I would just add the the one other you know I think important um, and in its in that time a uh, problematic modifier for Italians was they were Catholic too, right? Yes, uh, absolutely, and, and, and they were. And, and as it would have been said at the time, they were, by definition, uh, conspirators of Rome, uh, papal conspirators who who were, um, you know, and that's 
um, whose whose first loyalty was was by religious affiliation to to the Pope and and not to a nation that was beginning to or or was continuing to expect them to be loyal Americans, and that that informed all of this as well. Um, well, I don't want to rush rush past this though, and and um, in terms of the, the characters, um, uh, Joy, I I didn't I'd invite you to say a little bit more. Um, I, I'm just curious about the character of Ling Yang, um, in, in in particular, and and how you develop. Could you talk a little more about developing that uh, that character and kind of what what uh, how how you how you even do that um, to to create a character and um, what. How did that happen? You know, it's um, they're different. They're different. Historical novelists will will tell you different things about how much they want to know about a historical figure. I know Charles Frazier, wonderful, you know, author of Cold Mountain, wonderful North Carolina book. Um, I believe said he was so glad he didn't know much about his great great uncle um, Inman when he wrote Cold Mountain because he really just wanted the basic fact that he deserted from the Confederate army and walked home. To Cold Mountain. And um, I thought a lot about that because sometimes when you know a lot about a historical character, in fact, I was worried about George Vanderbilt because I I wanted to be prepared to be, to not like him, you know, um, if there was sort of a, a robber baron piece of him too, as there was um, in many ways about his father and grandfather. Um, so that's a whole different story. Ended up liking him very much, by the way, but that's a different story. But um, the, uh, the characters here, um, Ying Lung was um, someone I found in um, as best I could, uh, there were different versions of his name, but a reference to him in the archives, um, a man who came to Asheville because, as Jennifer said, because there were jobs. Um, and uh, tragically, and I don't, I, this originally was going to be in the book and um, I, I ended up cutting it out, leaving it out. Um, but he actually was a tragic character. He, um, uh, long story short, he was um, sort of some 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 a family put their dogs on him and killed him. Um, wow. He was he was walking through uh, the mountains by himself at one point, kind of running away from um, from a tragic situation. And anyway, but completely innocent man who was. Um, was attacked and um for racial reasons so he was a tragic character but anyway I wanted to sort of it's it's fun to be able to take obscure characters and either kind of if they were awful like Madison Grant sort of bring them to light people that we maybe didn't ever learn about or if they were wonderful and just forgotten to sort of um honor them in a way so I was trying to do that a little bit for him well, in the name of equal time, why don't we say a little bit more, a little bit about Sal and Nico, maybe as well. I know from a reader's perspective that that Sal and Nico were the were the hardest thing to deal with because of dealing with multiple uh, aliases and and real names and sorting that out in my in my mind. But but um, can you tell us about the origin of those characters? Well, they, um, as someone who's a literature person and not a historian like the two of you, I had completely forgotten about if I had ever learned um, about the the Italian race riots in New Orleans um, and in the early 1890s. And that was fascinating to read about and, and sort of um, a murder of the police chief there. And apparently they never quite figured out who it was, but the Italian community got essentially framed for it. And um, anyway, that was fascinating to learn. So as I was just trying to learn about the 1890s, you know, early and mid, um, that was sort of fun to wrap in this idea of um, in the midst of lynching several Italians in New Orleans for this um, for this murder of the police chief, um, they uh, several escaped. And so um, Sal is one of the one of the people who've who fled from New Orleans. Um, and so that was that was an interesting again, it's just fun as the writer to just sort of dig up these things, you know, that you're like, whoa, how did, how did I not remember that? So, um, right. So Sal is certainly working under an alias and, um, and trying to keep his little brother safe. Yeah. Um, obviously the protagonist, I mean, the, the main, main character is in, in this is a, is a woman character and there's a lot of interesting female characters in, um, in this, 
in this book. Um, so qu a question for for both of you um, to, but maybe uh, maybe Jennifer uh, first. Um, as you as you read this book and 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 thought about the different reflected on the different female uh, characters, um, what and 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 as you thought about how how you could you know share historical context and help help some of us understand um, the world in which these women would have been living um, better. Can you talk a little bit about the social and economic changes that were um, shaping um, women's experience in this period? Well, this was, you know, well into the period of very active um, activism for suffrage rights, but also for property rights, for higher education, right? This is a period of agitation for a lot of women from a lot of different areas. And this is a time when more women are having higher education opportunities, most of them not like Carrie. Carrie's situation is pretty unusual because um, it was mostly opportunities that were afforded to upper class, middle upper class women in this period. So I think it's very interesting to make her the sort of composite character that straddles two worlds at a time when that was extremely difficult to do, right? There aren't a whole lot of stories like that. Even though we kind of think of this period um, or we, we tend to imagine the American past as a kind of you can pull yourself up by bootstraps, that really wasn't true for a lot of people and certainly not for women, right? The opportunities for change and expansion weren't there and the expectation that you would serve your family first and foremost, no matter what your family was like right, um, is still clearly entrenched in Carrie's mind, right? She she returns home, right? So that that was one of the first things emotionally when reading that, you don't, you don't want her to go home. <laughs> you really just, just, just go to college, just do it, do it. <laughs> um, uh, but that, that I, I think that that's a realistic pull, a realistic draw. Um, she's had that inculcated into her as uh, also the eldest daughter, right, that she's got these certain responsibilities, even when women did earn money in this period, which many more and more of them did. By 1900, about 20% of everyone who worked in factories was female. Um, but the expectation socially was that they would be contributing that money to their family income, while young men who are unmarried and they could use most of that for themselves. So there's a lot of social disparities at the time that women are having ostensibly more opportunities to work outside the home, but their responsibilities for what to do with that money differed quite strongly from young men. Mm -hmm. um Joy, can you, can you, I'm curious to hear you weigh in just on, on as, as you did research for, for this book and, and started to develop the, develop what Carrie's experience was going to be in the book and um, what, what, what most interested you and what did you become kind of most, most interested in making sure you included in the story about, about women's experience in this period? It's, it's so much fun to hear it from the more academic angle, like Jennifer was just talking about. Um, Carrie, to me, was um, she, well, her her mentor, her teacher there in the mountains in one room schoolhouse was Annie Liz Lizzie Hop Hopson, um, whose name I stole from my great grandmother, who did just what Annie Lizzie did. Um, she left home at 19 and went and taught in the mountains of North Carolina, um, where there were no school teachers in a one room schoolhouse. And um, and then later she went to college and became um, very well educated, did all kinds of interesting things. Um, so that was sort of in my mind that that sort of person did exist, you know, but but what a struggle it was to um, to tell your family, here's what I'm going to do. And um, and that and that pull, um, as Jennifer rightly says, that pull toward the the sort of expectations that it wasn't just about you and your dreams or you and your opportunities. Um, so Carrie does come home. And I, um, I, a character that I'm interested in how readers react, the, the Lily character, very um, from a wealthy background, who's based loosely on the Lily Bart of Emily Wharton's wonderful House of Mirth. Um, just kind of a wink at the wink at the reader over that. But the Lily character there is um to me, interesting women, especially either really like her or really don't. And, and I, I'm curious about that because, and to me, she embodies a lot of just the struggle. If you're going to be independent, um, she desperately wants to be independent and also desperately does not want to be impoverished. And, um, 
uh, just the struggle within her. And she doesn't really trust other women, um, partly because she's trying to be independent. She doesn't, she's bored by drawing rooms and bored by a lot of the more traditional expectations of her. Um, so she's, you know, she's sort of um, done, I think what, what some women felt they had to do sort of push away other women during this time where, you know, if you're, if you're going to try to play a more aggressive game, you know, and not get caught in, in the sort of web of domesticity. So um, I'm, I'm just curious that even now it's interesting to watch sort of with book club, um, book club women, sort of what they say, especially about that one character, Lily. So I, I think your I think your facial expression tells me the answer, but 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 so different readers have had different reactions to her. What your what's your feeling about about Lily? Uh, I I I really like her spunk myself, but 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 I um I do not share her deep distrust of other women. But I I I must say I remember earlier in my life, maybe young adult years, when I was kind of trying to figure out, I came from a small town, trying to figure out um, what does it look like to try to, you know, forge your own path as a woman. I remember feeling sort of uneasy about not wanting to just get trapped in the kitchen to talk about diapers and recipes, you know, sort of how, how do you navigate this? And so um, anyway, so I'm, I do not share her, her deep dislike of, of my own gender, but um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just curious to hear different people's takes and readers always have brilliant things to say and very often things I've never thought of before. Right. Um, so let's talk, let's, let's focus a, a little bit on a little more on, on Carrie McGregor, um, central character. Um, she is obviously that, 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 that train ride, that, the begins the story is is uh is a trip between worlds uh, between very very different world uh, worlds and i guess it's a metaphor you know for the kind of navigate that travel is a is a metaphor at, at a certain level for for her effort to navigate um uh navigate change and and different places um what's what uh but and then ultimately we we're, we see her her life in this period of her life unfold in the in the mountain, the Western North Carolina mountains. Um, what what's going on um, in Appalachia in this period that we should uh, that we should understand? And and um, is it a time in which Appalachian culture is and 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 the and the kind of family ties in Appalachian culture are are being fortified and strengthened, or is it a time in which um, in which those those things are being uh, challenged or or enduring stress? Are you, I guess Joel, I, I'll let you, yeah, Joe, why don't you? Okay, and I'd love to hear Jennifer's um, yeah. parts too. Um, I was so curious in terms of the Biltmore um, about, you know, the train being, a, as you said, very much metaphorical, but also just the, what the train did by coming in to a place like Asheville and to these mountains that um, it could bring these wealthy northerners in who were just coming for the breathing porches, you know, a time when tuberculosis was a big killer. Um, and people could come to the fresh air um, just for fun or for health reasons. And um, so suddenly you had people with all this wealth coming in to this place that had just been um, very much, you know, sort of cut off from the rest of the world in many ways. And you still had a um, an economy that was still very much more a barter economy in the mountains at the time where you, you know, you took your, your apples and, um, you know, traded for flour or whatever you needed, that sort of thing. Um, and then suddenly you have all this money coming in. And um, one, one time years ago, when I was at um, the Biltmore with, with friends and was taking one of those van rides that goes out in the property out on the estate. And have one of those wonderful tour guides who just, you know, just has read more than they needed to, to get their job. And it was just delightful. And um, so I got to ask all kinds of, you know, obnoxious questions. There weren't many other people on the van. So um, we had a grand time. And at one point the tour guide said, now here is land of um, a particular farm family. And they were sort of on an island where um, George Vanderbilt threw an agent, through his friend, an agent, um, Charles McNamee had bought up parcel by parcel by parcel up to, you know, these hundred thousand acres 
under a different name so people wouldn't know it was Vanderbilt money behind it. Um, but toward the end, of course, once all this land has been bought up and it's quite clear, finally, who's behind this. Um, and a couple of these families just money meant nothing to them. And, and it was their family land for many generations and they weren't selling, you know, money. You could ask, you could offer any amount of money and it just, they weren't not moving from the land that the great grandparents um, were buried on. And um, so as the tour guide began to talk about these tensions, you know, that's catnip to a novelist to probably a historian too. Like anytime there's tension, as they say about a no or stories, you know, the cat sat on the mat is not a story, but the cat sat on the dog's mat. That's where a story starts. And same thing here where you've got the tensions of this tremendous wealth coming in. Um, and then you've got people for whom money doesn't mean anything. And then you've got others who are sick of um, this sort of subs subsistence farming and delighted to have a chance to take the money and leave. Yeah. Um, so you've got all sorts of different scenarios. And I just found that fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Jennifer, why don't you why don't you piggyback on that and offer some more thoughts? Um, well, I, I think during this period, because industrialization is just changing all the country, right? It's definitely starting in the cities. I I do think that even in the Appalachian Mountains, they're not immune to the attractions of new consumerism and the things that urban industrial life have to offer. So I think that some of that tension is definitely described by uh, bitter envy, right? And it's not unearned, right? To say, to look at somebody like George Vanderbilt coming in there and wanting this land because he can take it. Um, the resentment's palpable. And why, why wouldn't it be there? I mean, that seems natural and human in any point in time and place. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot of overlap and overlay between these different classes and races and even regions of the country, right? So rural areas, they're reading magazines and newspapers and catalogs and understanding a bit about what wealth is like. Uh, and it's a bit mind blowing for them, right? And so probably I would imagine in this specific circumstance to see it firsthand, I, I would be irate. And so I, I, I imagine many of them are because this is the one thing they had was this natural, pure beauty, right? That didn't profit them in any way. And it, and it still still really wasn't going to even when the industrial Northern money uh, was bringing the riches of the urban landscape to them. It was still going to be out of their reach. So that's, I mean, it's, it's kind of mean if you look at it from their perspective. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... So I'm 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 seeing the chat. So I I, I know that there's some great questions uh, emerging um, from the audience, which we'll we'll get to in in a minute. I'm trying not to be too too intimidated by the the one listener who's told us not to spoil the end of the book. She's not done yet. So so uh, we'll we'll do our best. But um, I, I feel like I might have already already made already messed that up. But um. Uh, for both of you, I, 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 this is the last question that, that I have in front of me. Um, I would love to hear you um, here. We'll we'll start with um, we'll start with Jennifer and then and then go to Joy um, about is there anything that you're working on currently that you you'd like to to share with the audience and 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 the reason I want to make sure that Jennifer you also uh, talk about that is because I'm totally intrigued. You may, may you may not be ready to talk about it yet, but that your current work is about changing changing ideas of of dressing for success and and that seems actually really germane to this uh to this this discussion i mean i i'm just thinking about carrie and what dressing for success meant when she was up at bard and what it mean what it means when she's down back down home uh might be a perfect case study a fictional case study for for what you're writing about but um uh why don't we why don't we start with with you jennifer and and, and then go to joy thank you i really appreciate that so um yeah my, my current book is looking at we have all these notions about what dressing for success means today. And I feel like a lot of them were forged exactly in these 1890s, beginning in these 1890s. And because of this, all this churning social change, industrial change and financial and economic change. So the Gilded Age is famously, you know, marked by 
ostentation by, you know, Veblen, uh, Thurstein Veblen's conspicuous consumption, right? Buying things to just show that you can. Well, but then there's also political pushback against that and labor resistance and activism um, and reform for financial things. So for all financial sectors. So what happens is people start to temper that. And so people like the Vanderbilts or in large financial situations or like CEOs of, of brokerages and insurance companies, they began to actually craft dress codes saying, hey, chill out. Let's let's dress a little more democratic. So uh, my book Lower is kind case of arguing. D. Lowercase d, democratic. Yes, 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 right. Dress in a way that says, hey, everybody can be on Wall Street. Hey, everybody could be a CEO, right? Remember, we live in a meritocracy. So a little bit of it's a performing meritocracy, right? But at the same time, it's also serving to bar people who aren't aware of these new and changing codes, such as new middle class, new black middle class in places like North Carolina, right? I'm from Wilmington, where... In 1898, there's a major race massacre and insurrection in part, in large part, reacting to the um, very hard won success of black families in this community. Um, and one of the like kind of weapons uh, leveraged against them is sort of accusations of, of, of you know, frivolity and, and overspending, right? So Dress becomes very performative, especially in the financial sector. And so instead of having like the JP Morgan uh, like caricature with the watch fobs and the hat and the diamonds and all of that, you start to get the kind of pinstriped um, and, you know, even body types that are acceptable, thin and athletic become much more um, deemed successful because it signifies restraint. So I think a lot of the ideas that we have about dress and personal appearances come from this era, and they're actually pretty exclusionary and defensive and serve to keep already wealthy white men in charge. Yeah, thank you. That's yeah, sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you for giving me a chance to talk about it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Joy, what, what are you working on now? It does. Well, first I need to, to hire Jennifer or like buy her lots of glasses of wine and drive over and let her... Um, consult on this next novel of mine, but um, this one is a uh, um, set dual timeline set in present day and World War II on St. Simon's Island, Georgia, and um, just lots of, you know, interesting home front and things that, um, you know, my agent for years has said, don't write another, you know, we don't need any more World War II novels in the world. Everyone's sick of them, you know, and, and she has a point, um, but the home front's a whole different thing. Um, so one of the characters is a wasp, you know, one of the women who ferried military planes all over the country. And they're fascinating. I sort of had, you know, sort of this level knowledge, you know, probably high school history class level knowledge, um, maybe one YouTube video level knowledge, you know. Um, so that's been really fun um, to, to dig into the actual stories of these women. And um, and I didn't realize that the that more people were killed, more Americans were killed on the East Coast of the United States during World War II by German subs than in Pearl Harbor. It's a, it was it blew my mind, but it was just, you know, the German subs were just right there. And one was right off the coast of St. Simons and um, and uh, hit two different ships and. 22 lives were lost. And of course, people were terrified because they didn't know, you know, are are the Germans actually walking up on the shore now? Are the planes coming over? Are, you know, um, so it's interesting again to sort of put yourself in that era, not not just knowing what we know now and who wins and who, you know, but really try to put yourself in that time period. So it's it's a present day and a and a World War II story intertwined where the Wow. Um, hopefully, ultimately, maybe not now, but ultimately we'll be woven together <laughs> if I do my job. <laughs> this isn't quite, this is not yet forthcoming. Like this is a, a little it's, way down the road. It's due to the publisher this fall. So it'll come out in the fall of 2024. Yeah. You don't have time to be doing this panel tonight, Joy. You have work to do. <laughs> Listen, it's a relief to get to talk to other human beings. <laughs> not just my dog. <laughs> Right. Well, um, I, I know that um, the audience has been um, has been getting appeals from Caitlin to uh, to put some uh, questions in the 
um, into the hopper. So at this point, I'm going to um, trust that that Caitlin has built up a, a backlog of great questions already and turn things over um, to her. Thanks, Mike. Um, yes, we do have several questions. Um, this is just also another kind of uh, verbal reminder. If you have a question for our panelists, feel free to throw that in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so I think the first one I'll, I'll just kind of go back and forth. This was, it wasn't exactly a question, but we have had several comments in the chat talking about um, the fashion as described in the book and of the period. Um, and it connected a bit to what Jennifer was talking about earlier. So I um, was hoping maybe she could elaborate on that and how um, that, Joy could also talk about how that shaped the characterization um, in the novel. Jennifer, do you want to start? Oh, okay. Um, sh sure. Well, uh, I, you know, fashion in this period is obviously very, very interesting. And I think Mike hit the nail on the head um, about how fashion is intrinsic to kind of the tension and stress that Carrie's going through, right? And the ways in which she's very aware of how she has to dress, right? You can really imagine this going from rural to urban, from poor to being around wealthy people. Um, I doubt there's anything that she wears and having to kind of constantly downgrade First feeling like she kind of sticks out because she is wearing wealthier or more urban or urbane clothing when she arrives, but then, then sort of adapting because very much clothing is still primitive. In this period, it absolutely marked you for who you were, where you were, and what your intentions were, right? And so you weren't going to, you were, it was going to make it clear that you were applying for a job and not in any position of power, um, dressed the way that she was going around looking for work. Uh, and I think that that's underscored well, and fashion's a great tool, for kind of of doing that same. Oh. It really just, uh, just to interject too, I mean, it, it this, that really sort of uh, brings me back to, to what we were talking, what, what y'all were talking about earlier, but just the importance of the railroad as this transformative technology, because one of the things that, that they, uh, that the arrival of, of a railroad um, extension or a railroad spoke off of a main line to a, to a new place did was essentially overnight it made that whatever that terminal point was in this case Asheville it it made it an extension of the urban the urban modernizing world right because it made that particular place across a crossroads and immediately brought a totally new kind of radical diversity and where diversity uh, where diversity was the meaning, the power, the meaning and power of how you dressed, how you adorned yourself, took on whole new layers of symbolic meaning, right? And 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 brought a whole new, not new kind of politics into the into the mix about who is representing them, their identity accurately or above station or you know or are they hiding who their true self is? It really added. Well, it's the it's also why I mean there's a reason why mystery novels are sort of born at the same time as as urbanization, right? Because cities are places of mystery because it's a place where identities get left behind and and new ones tried on for size. And in, in a way, Joy, your novel is 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 taking us into a, a a pretty little hamlet in the Western North Carolina mountains that's in that's at the moment of turning into a a modern urban place of of mystery. Right. There's a lot of anxiety about how clothing is used in that context, too, like confidence men, con men. The idea of that is born that there's this great history, history book called Confidence Men and Painted Women that's all about dissembling by how you make yourself appear and comport yourself in urban settings, which is, a you know, bringing you're bringing anonymity. You're bringing me back to my generation of, of, of I can tell you're a lot younger than me, but, but yes, it was Karen Halton was the name I was on my mind. Yes. <laughs> um, joy, but joy sorry sorry um, yeah, no, this, yeah. no, we can talk about this all day I you know I was and I think anyone who's done a tour at the Biltmore I think one of the standard things they tell you is that um, the women changed clothes complete change of clothes six or seven times a day and you know I mean talk about setting aside one class of people for another class of people, just the time alone, even if you couldn't afford the clothes, you know, not only affording the elaborate clothing, but just the time to have to, you know, in the different activities, were you horseback riding, were you, you know, walking, were you dining, were you dancing? And 
um, you know, that sort of elaborate or these, um, these multi-course meals too, you know, where you, it was a complete, you know, and the, the, the number of servants you had to have and um, just the whole, and, and as you say, then what they wore very much setting them aside so that with one look, you could determine who the servant was and, and, um, and who the, the ladies were from, you know, so a, a fascinating time period, but I, you know, I think a, a lot of Biltmore visitors are, entranced by that but also just sort of it's mind-boggling to think yeah. about a world where this was the expectation and it's the, the, i have to i have to drop a name just for everybody can look look this up and some of you are probably familiar with this name but here in winston-salem a very famous and fascinating historical figure is a woman named madam hancock or, Mo, or molly molly hancock um, who who was the first self, sort of self-professed couturier in, in North Carolina. And, yeah. and because at the turn of the century, she was rural born, but but she she went to New York and got a little bit of design training. And by the turn of the century in 1905, I think here in Winston-Salem, above what is a, a well-known pool hall today, she was running her own dressmaking shop and somebody like her was brought in. Uh, there was new importance because once once women, middle class women are starting to be able to buy very nice clothes kind of off the rack in, you know, in a growing retail industry, elite women need a new way to establish their elite bona fides. Right. And so somebody like Molly Hancock, who would travel to New York, see what was coming down the runways of an emerging high fashion industry would bring the patterns back and then make them dresses right that would set them set them apart this is so so it's so, such fascinating fascinating stuff so i'm sorry my my children right now are probably saying they don't need a history lecture daddy um <laughs> so everybody uh, needs a it's history so lecture. great i'm glad the question got out <laughs> some of us always need the history lecture <laughs> um caitlin do you have another question you um, that was fascinating to hear, guys. Um, so we had two interrelated questions about um, the construction of Biltmore and sort of the, the tension between um, kind of new folks coming in for work, folks who may be considered foreigners being brought in for work that maybe had specialties in a particular craft um, versus the local population. Um, and then that idea of is there resentment between those two groups um, and wanting to know more about how that transformed the landscape. I can jump in with one one interesting fact um, that uh, in terms of, the, you know, local people were hired in addition to uh, skilled artisans like from Italy and other places. Um, there are a number of photos that you can find in the archives of Biltmore and even some I think that the Biltmore itself has displayed like in the lower floors um, where blacks and whites are working together side by side, not segregated, which doesn't sound spectacular to us, but but you know was certainly um, notable for the time. So that that was intriguing to me. Um, and George Vanderbilt, that seems to have been something that he, you know, insisted on. Um, so I'm I'm intrigued. And of course, as as Jennifer rightly says, just the some who were anxious for the jobs that the Biltmore represented, and some who resented. And I I spent many. Um, many interesting times kind of sitting on that hill up um, with the statue looking out over Biltmore and trying to put myself in the place of, you know, being a farmer, just a, a simple landowner in Appalachia. And what what would I have felt watching the Biltmore go up, watching it being constructed? And I, like Jennifer, I usually landed on, I think I would have been mad. <laughs> I think I would have been resentful and bitter. Um, but also, if you have any eye for architecture or beauty at all, you can't help but be admiring. Um, so there's that. To kind of tie this question also to the previous one, I think that, you know, local people would have had a better opportunity to participate in this um, new service economy, basically, that's built around this one single family um, that uh, if you can play the role, if you're attractive enough, especially if you're a young woman, you know, or if you can adapt and, and dress well enough to be presentable, to be seen on the grounds in any way, shape or form. So I think appearances are becoming more important for everybody across the country in a palpable way related to this consumerism, related to the 
intermixing and the transportation um, related to the increasing opportunities, we kind of become walking advertisements, right, of our potential and of our worth. And so the scripts are, are kind of elusive. Um, but if you are intuitive enough to be able to play that game, you can you can work the system a little bit better. And, and I, I think what, what Joy offers here is that Carrie has both been exposed to it and has that intuitive smarts and she knows where she's lacking and where she has, you know, she's, there are times in the novel where she's very aware of what her hair looks like, right, <laughs> in, in the context of different situations, because, I mean, those things always mattered. Yeah, and it's to tag on to that um, in reading about how they chose the employees for the Biltmore um, there was very much this desire to be in that set of kind of the Gilded Age, very wealthy, to be like the wealthy of England. And so to sort of mimic a lot of that sort of what Downton Abbey, you know, mm -hmm. um, sort of look. So so the um, head housekeeper was brought in from Great Britain and um, the sh head chef was French and the, you know, one of the head stable um people was was Italian and you know so there were a number of Europeans brought in just because that felt more sophisticated we're still a very new country really not very sophisticated at this point um and so they local people were hired but again this attention to how people spoke and how they looked as Jennifer said is um is it you know as you try to as you try to sort of mimic what um what the grand homes of England and France are like. Okay. Caitlin, you got another one? I do. They're coming in. Um, this is a question more about writing, practice, and craft. Um, so Jenny wants to know, are kind of dual timeline novels um, all the rage? Is that a trend that's happening right now, or is it just something she seems to, that seems to be haunting her? <laughs> Great question. I um my for, my second novel was dual timeline set in Charleston, South Carolina, called A Tangled Mercy, and I swore I would never write another one. They're they're hard to write and to get you know sort of the emotional. You can't have something funny happening in one timeline and a tragedy happening in the other, and um to have it legitimately woven in a way that doesn't just seem phony and um. But but they are, I love to read them myself. And so I'm back at it writing another one. I think you're right um, that it it is a bit of a trend, but I think for a good reason. And I think maybe a lot of us too are intrigued by the um, commonalities between say, whether it's 1960s and uh, World War II or, you know, or, or, or say Gilded Age or present day. And um you know, other times it just, it's striking, whether it's political strife or certain attitudes or, um, you know, it's interesting how human beings are human beings and a lot of the struggles keep kind of um, poking up their heads over and over again. So maybe that's part of the appeal of the dual timeline that we're all maybe a little fascinated by, um, by being reminded of the interwovenness and, and being reminded of our history, you know, with, about, um, not being destined to repeat it and learning from our history and um, that sort of thing. Can I, can I piggyback in there too? Sorry, not to not to yeah. divert things, but uh, but on that on that point, um, we haven't talked much about Madison Grant. Um, but I, I was just looking back at the publication date. This is 2020 um, and, and that you that you published this novel. Um, I, I'm curious about whether as you uh, as you wrote this and obviously made a decision to bring Madison Grant prominently into the into the novel, um, whether to what extent you were conscious of and thinking about and observant of the fact that um, you know, sadly, sadly enough, the, the racial the racial theories of Madison Madison Grant, which have been a constant undercurrent throughout American uh, culture, but arguably in in the past five to ten years uh, and really maybe even within the last two or three years have seen a particular resurgence into the public culture um uh, what were you were you already seeing that as you brought your your writing of this novel to um to a close and or how 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 have you um reacted um after publishing this to see um, to observe that very fact I mean, it, it has been very striking to read, um, you know, I'd be, I'd be doing research one day and um, 
reading about the president of MIT, for example, spoke in just terms that we today would consider horrific in terms of sort of this fear of um, the replacement theory, you know, um, if we don't get rid of anyone who's not white, white people are going to be replaced. But he spoke in very offensive language, president of MIT um, at the time. And then I'd, I'd read something on the news that someone had just said that really sounded chillingly like that. And, um, you know, just to realize these, these fears, um, especially at times of great change, these fears, you know, bubble up. And um, Madison Grant, um, as far as we know, there's no evidence that he ever visited the Biltmore, but he was connected with the Vanderbilt family in that he was part of the New York Society, the very old families with money, highly educated. I believe he went to Yale. Um, and he was connected with Teddy Roosevelt and all these people. He he um, took money. He was gathering money for the Bronx Zoo. And so the Vanderbilts were one of the families that he um, solicited and got money from for the Bronx Zoo. And, and he's one of these fascinating to me historical characters who did a lot of good earlier in his life. He was part of um, creating Glacier National Park. He sort of headed up saving the American bison, uh, the American buffalo. He um, did a lot of good, but increasingly through his life became increasingly fearful of um, change and of immigration and of anyone who wasn't white and old, kind of old family, old money. Yeah. And um, and it and it increasingly turns more and more ugly throughout his life to the point that um, the book that he wrote was um, not only became a bestseller in around 1925, but Adolf Hitler read it and wrote him a fan letter saying right. that the book is my Bible. Right. So clearly, you, you don't want to end life <laughs> with a fan letter from Hitler. That, uh, that that's yeah we'll all agree on that uh, Jennifer I, I feel like I, I I interrupted and you might be have been ready to to go a different direction but do oh, no I was just going to kind of uh extend from that that you know hopefully many of us are surprised to hear intelligent thoughtful people uh maunder on about you know what we would think of as pseudoscience right and so I I imagine that Madison Grant who I don't know a lot about historically must have been hanging out with the eugenicist people and in Cold Harbor Springs, because that's who Hitler was being and loving um, at, at that that period you reference. So that that that's all just the fact that eugenicists, many of them, were highly highly educated and very very embedded in scientific communities. I mean, they yep. were the scientists of of the time. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. That was, I, I don't think I had remembered how well, how highly placed and highly educated they, they were. That was, that was um, a jolt for me to be reminded that the eugenicists really were, as you said, that all our best, all our best schools, all our best institutions, it, they were deeply embedded. Yep. And North Carolina was very into forced sterilization and eugenics, historically speaking. So, so North Carolina and California and were, were some of the most enthusiastic states. So Madison Grant being here is not unrealistic. And even even spotlight. closer to home, even closer to home, when Winston Winston Salem was was uh, was a was the heart of that as yeah, well. Absolutely, so, it was Mecklen yeah, right. Yeah, so. Uh, it's very, yeah, it's a really interesting story. So many, so many. I mean, this. I think this is a, testifies a joy to the the richness of your of your book, right? That that this is this is merely a th you know merely one thread that you can follow out from it, right? Um, even even as a you know transparently fictionalized history history novel, right? It can carry us into these you know really deadly serious um, discussions, and I, I think it you do you've done. Uh, intentionally or not on that theme you've done us a service by bringing it um bringing it forward in this in this form so thank you um so uh we have one more audience question and um that will i believe be the last one for the evening so um caitlin uh why don't you uh read that into being yes and also just wanted to note that Joy, you have a lot of fans who really love your writing style and your your level of detail Several people have said they could just feel the characters speaking to them. So just wanted to make sure you, you got to hear that. Um, but our, our final question um, is really looking at the space of kind of tension between um, newcomers and locals. Um, again, 
we have uh, folks who want to know if the local people did kind of end up benefiting um, from some of the investment that was made around Biltmore, um, the schools and skilled training, things like that. Um, we also had someone else who said, well, what about when you have these large developments that come in, whether it's something like Biltmore, something more contemporary, like the building of Dollywood into these rural areas, the tension between development and opportunity and those spaces, um, but also the, the sort of local family history, the local culture. I'm just wondering if you guys could expand on that a bit more. I could jump in just with, I was fascinated with um, George Vanderbilt's vision and then the woman he marries after the span of this novel, but Edith Vanderbilt, um, I was fascinated given the kind of conversations we have now that I think we think of as a little more modern sort of how do you, if you have compassion for a situation where people are struggling um, economically or um, in terms of development, how do you help without hurting? You know, we've learned you don't just necessarily throw money at it or send a bunch of Americans down, you know, to for building projects, you know, that you can hurt an economy more than you help it. So how do you genuinely help? Um, and I was fascinated with George Vanderbilt being really an early thinker in this. He um, thought seriously about becoming an Episcopalian priest. He had a close friend who was an Episcopal, Episcopalian priest. And he just spent a lot of time thinking and reading Philip philosophy and theology and thinking about if you care about people, um, how do you help them? And, and including Appalachian people in the North Carolina mountains. So um, I just found that intriguing that it, he, he knew enough to know, you, do, you know, just throwing money at people just because he had more and they had less wasn't necessarily a way to give people jobs or dignity. And so, you know, a lot of Biltmore Industries grows out of that um, and a lot of just fascinating things. So anyway, I was just, I was intrigued by that because again, we think of that as a more, um, aren't we smart to, you know, to have, be having these conversations now and he was having them in the 1890s. I don't really, I think it's a really un, uneven answer uh, historically how much, um, you know, the locals grew to um, appreciate or even maybe, you know, materially benefit, right? Um, in many of these situations, I mean, Joy, you know a lot more about George Vanderbilt himself and how he might have had more attention than was common. Also, he might have had the familial experience of the backlash that some of his parents and, and you know, family members experienced uh, going into situations and trying to be what they considered to be philanthropic. Um, so, so my guess is, is, is exactly the premise of this question means that the answer is uneven, right? They're changing the landscape so radically, so drastically. I'm sure some people very much appreciated that change, right? Because it brought them more opportunities and other people saw it as a blight on the landscape or as an intrusion in their culture. Um, so I think it I think it depends on the priorities, whether or not you're the people who didn't sell or the people who sold and appreciated the opportunities that that afforded them. Um, I think it's going to be it's the same thing, you know, bringing a Dollywood in or even a Walmart right today <laughs> talking about weighing those options, whether or not you're, you're damaging more than you're, um, helping it's, it's so, uh, colloquial and personal. Yeah. Well said. Well, I think that's, yeah, I think that's it. So good. Yeah. I just saw Melissa here to officially bring it to a close. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I want to say a special thank you to Joy and Jennifer for their conversation this evening and to Mike. Uh, for moderating this evening's program. Uh, and thank you to our wonderful audience for attending and for asking all of those great questions. Uh, we appreciate your time and engagement. And after the conclusion of this event, those of you who registered with an email address will receive a brief survey to complete. And that will also have the link to the recording of this program. So we would greatly appreciate uh, if you took the time to complete this survey so that we can hear your feedback about this program, um, you can visit our website at www.nchumanities.org to learn more about our upcoming events in the North Carolina Read Series. We have one left. Uh, and to subscribe to our email newsletter, Joy and Jennifer, if you all have a website that you want to pop in the chat to everyone, Joy, maybe your author website, 
uh, where they can go to find your next book. Uh, you can throw that in there as well. Um, so I wanted to just say uh, thank you again for everybody uh, for attending and to have a great evening. That will conclude our program. So thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.